uh, I it's approximately 706. I recommend <laughs> and call, call the meeting to order. Uh, does anyone want to make a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second it. Motion second. Any uh, corrections or additions to the agenda? There being none, uh, if everyone could vote. Aye. 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 The agenda is approved. Uh, we have a motion on the consent agenda items. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Um, did Nat, did you say something? No, I was going to do the same thing. Oh, okay. Would you want to second them? I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, any further discussions on the consent agenda items? There being none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposer or abstentions? There being none, the consent agenda items approved. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak? I don't hear anything from the public. Uh, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, select board items. Uh, since I added uh, agenda item A, uh, I'll just kind of read what was kind of recommended by Maroney Minter uh, from the Vermont Racial Equity Task Force uh, as a potential motion to include either on our website, the town report, that would be your favor, but I'll read the, uh, the declaration and then we could have a discussion. The Town of Waterbury Declaration of Inclusion. Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all people, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity, or expression, age, or disability, and will protect these classes to the fullest extent of the law. As a town, we formally condemn discrimination in all its forms and commit to a fair and equal treatment of anyone, everyone in our community. Waterbury has and will continue to be a place where individuals can live freely and express their opinion. Any discussions on the declaration? Is this uh, something that's being proposed to be voted on through the town meeting process? Well, it. it yeah. How does this work, Bill? Is this something that a petition has to be put forward for in order to include your muted there? Um, my, my, my forward of that, my uh, reading of it was that it was being recommended that the select board simply adopt it. That was not going to town meeting. But Mike, um, did he send that to you directly or what? Yeah, that was my intent. I don't necessarily, at least I don't think any open-minded person, there's nothing in that declaration that I, I don't think anyone would find offensive. Maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, and I was thinking it wouldn't be at town meeting, possibly, you know, I, I like the idea of it being posted on our website as something that we, we stand for, you know, that we're a community that condemns racism and any kind of discrimination of all forms. And I think if it's on our website, it basically says something. I don't think we, we would have to have a town meeting resolution on this, but does anyone have any dissenting views on that? No, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how the process worked, if that was something that just couldn't simply be passed by the select board. Uh, 
whether or not it had to go in front of the people, uh, the town's people. Um, Maroney did reach out to me. Uh, and uh, I was out of town. I responded to him, I don't know, a day or so afterwards. I <clears throat> actually requested a uh, sit down discussion between him and I. Um, talk about, you know, what what this issue was and what it pertained you know the how what it meant you know what what the uh, structure of it was um what it was supposed to i guess do um as far as i mean it's kind of clear in its reading what it pertains to but you know what's the, what's the background behind it and um uh, or more of the motive, you know, what do you <clears throat> put something like this in place? To, to um, me, to me, it has it's, to have a, a reason for it. And I was just curious what that was, you know, but he never got back to me. So, yeah, to me, it's very similar to what a lot of corporations and stuff have as part of their, their being kind of like equal opportunity statements. And I think that's just a statement of kind of their being. Uh, again, I think based upon law, I think we're all supposed to operate based, you know, there's there's nothing that I read in that declaration that was nothing. Everything there is things that we have to operate in terms of equal opportunity. It's It's the law. Kind of common sense, isn't it? Not even common sense. It's the law. <laughs> it's it's federal law that you know, you know that, you know, we can't discriminate against people due to race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender, or exp or expression, age, or disability, and protect these classes. The only thing that I might have added. You know, there are protective classes. One other class that is protected by state law is uh, people who receive public assistance. Because that has, that's probably one of the biggest areas that people are discriminated against in Vermont is someone who's on public assistance gets discriminated just because they are on public assistance. Someone doesn't want to provide them services because they are receiving public assistance. That's well, against Vermont law. Yeah, and it's clear all that's against Vermont law. I think the, the critical thing, this isn't asking us to adopt an equal opportunity statement. I mean, it's in there, but if you read the first word, it says, Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all people. Uh, you can abide by the law and still be a racist. So what this is asking the select board to do is to call racism what it is and, and condemn it and say, we're, we're, we're not going to tolerate that attitude. Uh, there are plenty of people that can stick up a poster that says, we're an equal opportunity employer, but they might still be racists. And I think it's just asking you, it's a pretty straightforward question. Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all people, regardless of all those things. And as a town, we formally condemn discrimination. So it's, it's more, it's a philosophical statement as much as it is to say we're going to obey the law. So, uh, I, I think the question asked by Maroney and the other folks, um, the anti-racism coalition, is to get the select board to adopt this statement to condemn racism for what it is. And I'm doing an awful why, why do they feel like they need to do that? Why? I'm, I'm not telling you what, why, I'm just telling you what it, says what the reading of it is uh, I, i'm just concerned about what that means from a legal standpoint from this point onward if the select board agrees to something like that 
there must be legal implications involved that we don't know about. If you have a business and somebody goes to apply for a job at your business and they're of a different racial orientation or sexual orientation or whatever, and you decide that, you know, that's not the right applicant and they can turn around and say, well, you, do, you didn't hire me because I'm this, that, or the other. This is where things are going. And I think it's really important to consider when things like this come across, well, you know, this is not a legal you know, I, document. I, I just want to finish my point. I'm really concerned about stuff like this. Understand. I don't think, I think it's, 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 it's almost like an affirmation that we're making. And it's just saying that we, as Waterbury residents <clears throat> condemn basically the reasons that go into equal opportunity. And I don't, I'm not a legal scholar, but I don't think there's any negative connotations to what is is included here. Well, maybe this, we should this, understand this that there are legal connotations because I'm starting to sense that there are. Why is this even breached? Why is a subject like this right now breached at all? You know, we live in Vermont. You know, this this is like the first state that was anti-slavery. You know, you can't force people to not be racist. You're a hundred percent right. You but know, Vermont does not. Uh, for, Vermont does have <laughs> racism and bigotry. It, it's but you it's can't, here. You can't legalize that. You cannot. This is not a. This is not a legal document. This right. is not yeah, a law. This is where it's let, let me finish. You asked to finish. Let me finish. This okay. is not a legal document. It's a statement condemning a practice. It's it's not anything that says you have to believe something or right. someone else has to believe something. It's saying the Waterbury Select Board, Waterbury condemns racism. Your example before about somebody applying for a job that's a uh, different race or a different sexual orientation, those, as Mike said, are already protected classes. If you don't hire somebody and they're of a different race, they can say they didn't hire me because I'm X, Y, and Z race, they can file a, a lawsuit. Doesn't mean that you really did that, but that's the world we live in. People can file a lawsuit if you, if they think that you breached their civil rights. That's where we live. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to just ask a question, um, and it does pertain to me. I mean, I was labeled a racist at the drop of a hat for using a wrong word. I think if you listen to my entire discussion about the issue that I was talking about, it was clear that I was trying to solve a problem and put some ideas into something that maybe somebody else hadn't already thought about, or you'd be surprised the feedback that I've gotten where people have said, I agree with you, Chris. I, I, in fact, I had a one woman say to me one day that, you know, if I had a police officer coming to my house, I'd want it to be a white police officer. For me personally, I could care less what color they are. They're police officers. They're officers of authority of the law. You know, I would expect to be treated as such. But the fact that, you know, when you said, um, when you use the word racist, that's in the eyes of the beholder. You know, whoever decides to say you're a racist and they pile on a bunch of other people on top of it, and they never even talk to that person or, have any interaction ever in their life and the outcome is horrible disgusting uh i wasn't brought up that way i was i have always treated people equally across the board i don't care the color isn't an issue for me yeah i'm just concerned about this is like such a hot topic right now and it's, exactly. it's, you know, like, it's like getting you know rehashed and rehashed and rehashed I'm not a racist. Why am I considered a racist? Because I don't agree with something that maybe a black person says even. Do you know what I mean? 
I mean, it's just getting crazy. Like, why is it so important for the select board to announce this? Because to me, it's it, this is like, okay, you announced this today, then it's going to be something tomorrow, then it's going to be something the next day. You know, it's just getting, I don't know. I have absolutely no problems as a select board member standing behind this statement. Well, it's a and, I, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna leave that right there because that's my personal opinion, and I am part of the select board. But right. it's no different than the company that I work for having a website and publishing a mission statement. Okay, that's their mission statement. It doesn't mean that every employee in the company is 100% behind that mission statement. It's, it's who the company affiliates themselves with. And I have no problem standing behind this statement from the Waterbury Anti-Racism Coalition because I think that it just, um, I've, I've got no problem saying to anybody that I agree with that statement. I'll jump on that with um, Nat. Sorry, Katie, go ahead. I said, I'm jumping on that with Nat. To me, this is basically agreeing with what we bring up our kids with in school, the golden rule, treat others the way that you want to be treated. So to me, that's what this is. And your point, Kathy, of this is going to roll into something else and something else. Well, this, our job is to have people come to us with their ideas and we can either say yes or no, or maybe have a different idea next time and come back and try to work together with something. We'll cross those bridges when we get there. But right now we're just talking about accepting other people like us just like us there's no difference to me so just agreeing with this is just respecting other people that's well, how i see it Ella, can you let me share the screen just i think it might be helpful to people to be able to read what we're talking about because yeah, it's, it's not seen. saying anything about legal requirements or anything else exactly. it's basically saying it's a statement of affirmation law, and i don't think anybody even if they are racist, can't really justify that it's it's right. I just, I don't have any issues with it really either, Nat. I'll be honest with you. I just don't want it to be used as a beating stick, like like what happened to me. I don't. I would hate to have any of you exactly. have that happen to. I agree. <laughs> but if you look at somebody the wrong way, they're going to consider you a racist or something. You know, it's just getting out of hand. Okay, just read just read the statement <laughs> and chris i don't think that statement's going to be used because i think and and there are folks on both sides folks are on the anti racist you know they're very quick to sometimes be very politically correct about different issues but i'm pretty comfortable with this statement because this is just our affirmation that we think people are should to be treated equal. I don't think there's anything in there that's going to bring on further things, et cetera. I think it's, I don't know, I, I don't see any harm in here's, this at all. Here's the statement. Part of it's cut out, Bill, by our photos there. I don't know if you can move it to the center, uh, of, the, center of the page at all. You can you can minimize your photo, the photo thing. There we go. Right. Just go to the one Better. photo. So pretty straightforward and pretty plain on its face. It's not uh, not anything that is a legal requirement. Exactly. I, well, I'm not talking about a legal requirement. I'm just saying, you know, things mushroom. This is what I've experienced in my life. Okay, you start with this and then becomes that. Why is it necessary to state this? when it's, it's pretty clear in our laws and everything that, you know, it's... This is almost like a mission statement, as Nat refers to it, that we're just very much in, in favor of people being treated equal. And I don't think it's, you know... It goes into legal requirements, et cetera. The law is the law. This is not, this just says we believe in people being treated right. Yeah, it's, it's Mike, it's a generic statement that says people need to treat everybody, which is fine, with 
care and dignity, period. Right. And and to be honest, Chris, I think I thought how you were treated in that whole thing was reprehensible. Yeah. It was it was a lynch mob, not quite as bad as the Capitol, but it was for our local community. It was a lynch mob. Yeah. yeah. I don't have any. I don't have any. Issues. I don't think that's good either. This yeah. this is basically um, <laughs> this is basically a blurb of the Bill of Rights. And yep. So I, I have no problems with it. Um, Bill, can you scroll down to the bottom of that statement? I'm as far as it goes on my screen. What's the last thing that you can read? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So are we looking for a motion? Well, I think we need to settle. Do we just want it on the town's web page? Is, is that where we're going? Sure. Sure. I would agree with that, that I would call for, for a motion to uh, adopt this declaration. So moved. Seconded. Thank you. <clears throat> moved and seconded. Uh, let's have a vote. All in favor, say yay. Yay. Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? There being none, motion carries. I saw M Mark's name there. Is Mark, are, are you on? Yeah, I'm on. I have terrible internet in my house, but I will do my best. Do you want, do you want to take the helm? Um, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, I'm late. No problem. If things happen. All right. Second on the agenda is the review draft annual meeting warning. Have people gotten that? I don't believe I've gotten a, a draft annual meeting warning. Yeah, we'll see it soon. And I got it there. Got it. <laughs> How could it go? To the desk. <laughs> I've got too many. Uh... Yeah, Hang on. You want me to try it, Bill? Oh, hang on. I just had it. Oh, I know where that went. <clears throat> I'm getting there. So um, this is the warning that we put together. If you remember, we're going to vote everything by Australian ballot this year. 
Uh, so these articles over here, uh, we're not, we've got to fill in the blanks in terms of the numbers. Um, we won't be able to do that until probably next Monday when you'll ultimately have to approve the warning. Um, hey, Bill. Yeah. Is it possible to make that any larger? Or never mind if you can't, if that's. That's as big as it is, can get on my screen. Okay. I'll just get closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I can't make it any bigger than that, sorry. Um, so the front office staff that does the collection of taxes is suggesting August 13th was the second Friday in August for the first tax collection date. And then the first Friday in November, uh, because the second week of November, it's right up against, um, Veterans Day and we have problems with the post office. So they're suggesting November 5th. Really the only thing I think that you have to um, decide upon, you agreed last time, I guess, to have <laughs> Article 8 on there. Shall the town authorize cannabis retailers and integrated licenses in town pursuant to 7 BSA 863? Um, <clears throat> there are actually two questions in that in that statement, and there's three options of what can be asked. So the way that Carla has written it here, this allows cannabis to be sold and also to be the production of cannabis to happen in the town. Um, you can split this article into two if you like. And if you want that other language, I can try to find it. It'll take me a little bit. But um, it, it could be two questions. One, asking the <clears throat> town to allow production, and the second, allowing retail. And one or both could be approved or denied. If, if we leave it this way, uh, this is all in one, and they can do both if this article passes. If you think that the town might approve one and deny the other, you would want the other language. So did this get added to last week's agenda when I, was, when I wasn't here? Because I don't recall voting on it to get put on the warning the week before that. It was last week, I think. Chris, we didn't we didn't vote on it, but I think in that meeting there was enough. Nobody nobody's voted on the board, this, yeah. so this that's why a, they added this it. This is a draft warning. No, I mean, we were asked we were asked to put this on for the select board's consideration. You don't you don't have to vote to put it on a warning to be considered. So if the select board doesn't want to ask this at all, you just you don't have to make a vote. You just tell us, you know, take it off. But three of the board members have to say either leave it on or take it off or change it. So there's been no vote on this at all yet, except we've been asked to allow the select board to consider it. So there it is. Consider putting it on the warning, right? Yeah. And that's what you're doing now. If, if the board, there's one other article that, that we're going to have to put on here, but I don't have the language tonight and I can't talk about it in great detail, but it has to do with, uh, with the uh, Tender Mountain Child Care Court case. Um, and there's going to be a, you know, uh, discussion between the parties this week and, and then I'll be able to come back to the board next week to see if we need an article or not. So you can't approve this tonight anyway, because there's one more article that may be uh, necessary to consider. And we're going to have to plug the right numbers into these articles over here. So tonight is just kind of look at this and see if this so far meets your needs. And the last thing I'll say is uh, the 
to Carla and me anyway, it seemed that the select board was asking that we allow people to vote on each individual um, special article rather than just lump them all into one, which would be a like a $59,000 article. I, I kind of like this. I, I, I always kind of didn't like the idea of, a, I know it was for, you know, for to expedite the meeting to not have all sorts of small articles for all these little ones. But if you're doing it in the in the voting booth, I think that is where people get get a real say if they don't really approve of, you know, some of these organizations, it's a lot easier to hit their, you know, no on on their uh, ballot. And I think that's a reasonable thing. Yes, people don't have, as in town meeting, someone will, you know, speak for an organization. But this, I think, gives people, you know, the right to say no, where I don't think a lot of people are willing to do that in an open town meeting. Thank you for opening up that last page. I was wondering, I said, this can't be all, all the ones. And then you flipped it over. I said, where, where was the $20,000 for the senior center? But now I see where all the articles are. And I, again, I don't see the last page here, but it, it all seems to be appropriate. I, I personally don't, wouldn't, especially if we're doing it by Australian ballot, it's much easier to, to have them voted on individually. I like the idea individually as well, just so we see if maybe there seems to be heavy support for one article versus others. And it might just, as we try to decide what we're gonna do with special articles, just to see if there seems to be certain things that might be falling out of support and just help us direct the funds in the future. But um, I, I, I agree, I, I like the specific articles. In terms of, of article eight, um, I don't personally feel like it needs to be split. I think it's either yeah. going to be a, a yes or no for residents on whether or not they want to support marijuana um, re or just business in town. Um, I think if we use the word integrated, I can't remember what the other word is there because it went off my screen, but um, I think there'd be some confusion on what it is. Um, I, I think just putting it forward, but I think it's an important article that needs to get on you know, this round just because of what the state has set up for opt in, opt out, and the ability for people to get into this business that we have an obligation to let the town residents decide whether or not they want those types of businesses in this town. So those who want to get into that type of business have the opportunity to do so. Bill, could you again show that third page? I kind just of- a minute. Um, I'll go back to that. These are these are the, the options for Article Eight. So this one here is the one that is on Article Eight right now. Shall the town authorize cannabis retailers and integrated licensees into town pursuant to Seven DSA? Uh, you can instead of that, you can allow this one and this one. So you can see this, this combines it, and you can see down here what the Australian ballot, a cannabis retailer means a person licensed by the state to sell cannabis and products. Uh, an integrated licensee means a person licensed by the state to engage in the activities of a cultivator, wholesaler, product manufacturer. So when I read this, I, I thought this one, which was Article 8 on the warning was simpler than having these two, but it's really up to the board. I agree, Bill. I, I don't think most people, including myself, would understand what integrated licensees are. You know, that's, that's kind of a very legalese kind of term. And I guess, you know, I think if you include both, it's basically people know, are, are you allowing cannabis sales or, or cannabis activities in town. It's already legal to smoke and grow it, you know, for your own personal consumption. Right. 
Well, I don't wish to see Article 8 at all, period. And I think you probably know that by now. Oh, just for the record. Yeah, well, that... That's my opinion. There may be others out there that think like that, Chris, and, you know, you're on the select board, so you five have to decide whether it's on there or not. People have the right to vote no. I would say let the people talk. Yeah. I always like democracy. Well, just another question. Are we going to talk about um, the the stipend designated to the senior citizens um, before that goes on there officially? Well, here it is right here. So last week when the senior citizens were here, uh, Justin, uh, the chairman of their board, made, made the pitch and asked for an increase of $2,500. Um, we have a two-pronged uh, way of funding the senior citizens. Uh, there's a $10,000 line, there has been a $10,000 line item in the budget, um, you know, in the standard budget in the general government fund. Um, and, and then this $20,000 special article. After Justin was here last week, I believe the board made a motion to, uh, well, there was consensus anyway, I don't know if there was a motion to put 12,500 in the budget and leave $20,000 here in the uh, special article. So when we get to the budget, I mean, you can talk about this now, Katie, if you want, but uh, that's what my take was last week, that you wanted 12500 in the budget and 20000 as a special article. I agree, Bill. Did you have something that you wanted to ask, Katie? No, I was just wondering um, what, where we ended up with that. Um, so well, Mike, Mike had lots of questions, and Mike, Mike suggested that maybe this no, what you say it wasn't the year to end. Yo, what's up? Excuse me. Uh, I'm sucking they, dick. They, someone, one of your oh, employees you leaked your Snapchat, Zoom. Please. Ooh, someone okay. leaked your Zoom code. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got him, Jordan, back. Things are made hacking into our program here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Not muted. What are you doing? Someone Weird. leaked. Uh, oh, someone oh, leaked oh. your Zoom. It was you who leaked the Zoom. On Twitter. Get those guys Me. out here. Hey, <laughs> Juan, Pio, Pio, baby, Pio, Pio. Guys, you guys can leave this video. Come on. I ain't leaving. Don't, don't. Can you kick them out? Okay. Do we have Rich, a, your glasses still? Do we have a waiting room for this meeting that we can try we to? We do, meet? but I don't know who these people are, so I guess I won't. Look at Lisa. Can I have a Snapchat? Brian Mendoza, get rid of him. <laughs> Man, I've never seen this happen before. I won't let any. I, I won't let anybody in. I, I don't know. I guess. I've heard about this. Oh, and David James? Get rid of him. Where? David James. Right. Carla, if you open up the participant list, you can also mute and cut off people's video. Okay. Please one, 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 one by one. Please not, sir. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, again, that's... Yeah, Anna Coleman. Another sign if they're if they're hacking into they here they must think that it's important enough to hack into. Why is that? Some people are just malicious for the sake of being malicious. <laughs> I have I saw something in a fish and wildlife me, uh, meeting on fishing regulation that it's someone only... hacked in. Let's get David, back to David, order here. Um, David, yeah, please. <clears throat> We were talking, we were on the screen about the uh, warrant. Right, we were talking about the, um, the so senior we center budget. The senior citizen center. Yeah. Last week, Mike 
suggested that maybe this wasn't the year to, to increase anything. There was lots of discussion and debate. And ultimately, I think Carla and I believe the select board said, uh, we'll go for the $2,500 increase and we'll do it by adding $2,500 to the budget and keeping the $20,000 special article. That's, that's what I remember no, from the meeting as well. Yeah, if there's no changes on that. No, there is. It's $2,500. The, the, change, the change is in the budget, not in the special article. Right. I mean, if there's no changes tonight on it, we can right. move on to whatever's next on the warrant. There's anything of substantial change on the warrant that you wanted to uh, talk about? Well, I don't know if there's anything that we want to. Do you know of any substantial changes, Bill, other than, I mean, the last, the wording overall for the articles over the last few years have been pretty much the same. Is there anything that stands out to you that's substantial? No, I think. Carla, we put everybody on there that was on a year ago, right? And yep. there was the one organization that went defunct during 2020. Uh, but all of these things have appeared in the past, one way or the other. I mean, the standard one through 10 or one through nine or whatever, over one through, yeah, one or through seven. seven. Those were pretty much. Yeah, these, these are the standard articles. We'll just have to. We'll just have to put the right numbers in before we're done. We, this is, these are all last year's numbers. So I don't have any issues with this warning at all. Um, Mike's point earlier, you know, being this year is the first year that we'll have an Australian vote, I think will probably expose a lot of information as to whether or not, you know, how many people will be more engaged on, on an Australian vote than at a town meeting? I certainly hope it doesn't get rid of town meeting. Uh, is there a possibility on, you know, depending on that, that special articles, how they turn out, uh, if, it, if we find that a lot of people participate in those special articles, as well as the rest of it too, but particularly the special articles, is there a way of putting those on Australian ballot? There isn't separating. Okay. No, you, uh, a town gets to choose to act on public questions by four vote or by Australian ballot. Um, there may be a, I, I don't want to say a definitive no, but I don't think it's easy to fix. But, you know, that's a question for next year. Yeah. Okay. Now, we haven't talked, I know, I think it's really important because weren't we planning on having some sort of informational meeting prior to? Yes, we have to. So, and we probably need to set a date for that sooner than later. When we, when we approve the warning next week, you will set the date for that uh, information meeting. Okay. I think we're all set, Mark. We want to move on. Yeah, do we need to, is there a motion you made or we need that? No, we need any motion now right? because okay. the oh, it's all set. Okay. So we are going to move on to manager's items, library budget. And there's the library budget. Uh, that I sent out to all of you over the weekend and the library commissioners are here and all the and all of the library director is here so I'm gonna let them take it away. I'll move up and down this page as necessary, but I think that's about everything I do to see it all. Oh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Sure can. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shannon DeSantis Guile, and I'm one of the co chairs of the commission this year. Um, so, say the commissioners are pleased to report that, in spite of the library closure at the start of the pandemic, our circulation was 
73% of what it was in 2019 and 86.5% of what, what it was in 2018. And we boasted a 156% increase in circulation of digital materials, ebooks, and audiobooks, proving that our community needs the library more than ever. While it has been a difficult and challenging year for all of us, we commend Almi and her library staff for rising to the occasion. Their ability to provide library materials through curbside service, pivoting, uh, pivot offering to virtual programs virtual tech support and continued phone support following the library building closure at the start of the pandemic has been nothing short of extraordinary. Almi and her staff have worked diligently to keep library services available and robust while keeping taxpayers and her staff safe following all of the necessary health and safety protocols. We realized over $40,000 of savings in 2020 for the library, for the town by cutting and spending and staff hours. And that will carry forward for the town in 2021. This budget reflects keeping the library at reduced staffing levels until April 1st, when we will determine whether it's safe to open the building and allow the library staff to return to their full hours. And Bill has the numbers up on the screen. We are welcoming any questions. Hey, Bill, I have a general question. Was the budget that we're seeing here, was it the same as what you had sent to us? Yes. Okay. So this, this budget, um, and I explained this to everyone, up here, this is the recommended tax amount that I, um, uh, okay, at the top of the page, the 433, 535, is the recommended tax amount that I came up with uh, because you know my charge from the select board was to uh, keep the tax rate at 51 cents. And I've got three operating budgets and six capital funds that I've got to fund. And this is the number that I came up with after a long kind of arduous uh, week. Um, I left in here the 14,255 from the trust fund, which is the same amount that they transferred last year from the library trust. And then um, put together a, an expense budget that is $507, $830. And that basically is the budget that all me and the commissioners have asked for. I filled in a couple of blanks that we didn't have last week, the $61,015 for the two MBOF and uh, a couple of other small things. But the 507830 is pretty close to what the commissioners discussed last week. So in a normal year, that those revenues and those expenses with last year's fund balance, which was $41,028, would bring that budget into balance. But here, as I said in the memo yesterday, the 2021 budget ends with a $16,562 deficit. So one of a couple things can happen. You can just leave it like that and plan to have a year-end deficit and see what happens at the end of the year. We typically don't budget for large variances from zero. Um, but you could just leave it the way it is and allow the deficit to be on paper and then see what happens in, at the end of the year. Or you have to cut expenses or increase revenues to, to balance this. So you could, you know, cut $5,000 out of the budget and uh, add, add um, $11,000 to revenue and balance the budget, but that's really up to the commissioners to do. The select board's role is to tell the commissioners how much taxes you're going to support in the budget. That's really all the select board has to say about it. The commissioners certainly can explain what they want to do with their money, why this budget of 507830 supports their program. But the select board, the only decision you really get to make is how much taxes you're going to support.
Do you mind if I ask uh, the one of the commissioners, whoever could answer the question, that 14255, which comes from the uh, trust fund, is that a fixed uh, number or is that can't be a percentage of, of the uh, overall uh, gain of the, of the trust, is it? I mean, that would that number would fluctuate if it was based on a percentage. So that must be just a fixed number that you guys kind of calculated um, somehow to, uh, to draw out every year as a consistent number. Can they hear me, Bill? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, it used to be a formula that we um, would apply based on how the fund did. Um, we had moved away from that in the past couple of years because the formula had us <clears throat> contributing more in years where things were good for both us and good for the town. And it didn't have us contributing when things weren't good for us in the fund and weren't good for the town. So we, um, <clears throat> you know, had, had talks over the last few years about making that number something more fixed so that we weren't giving more in years where the town didn't necessarily need it and giving less when the town did need it. Um, so um, hence why we moved to something more fixed. You know, the commission, I think, has intentions to maybe discuss the merits of that again. Um, but that is the reason why it went it sort of stayed flat in this budget. Yeah, understood. Yep. Overall, I don't think the budget's, you know, a $16,000 deficit. I think that can be dealt with through the avenues that Bill, Bill had suggested. Um, I don't see anything that's outstanding. Uh, at 61.15, that's just for the uh, just for the loan, apparently the bond, yeah, their so portion of, or what is that bill? The two MBOF that is just how the library pays its share of the expenses to maintain and operate this building. So I've got a different budget for the building, Fund 76. Uh, and the library, we agreed when we came into the building that we just divided that on a square footage basis. So the library has 53% of the uh, square footage in the building. So the library fund raises 53% of the money. So that 61,000 gets sent over to fund 76, just like the debt service line does. Uh, the library pays 53% of the debt service for this building because it was 53% of the size of the building when it was built. Right. Uh, so that goes up and down a little bit every year. Um, so that was the only number that I had to plug in this past week that the commissioners really hadn't seen before um, this weekend. Now, like, like always, you know, I want to commend the library and the commissioners for doing a great job keeping things under control under the circumstances. Uh, it's been tough for everybody. And I don't think we're, I don't think we're out of it yet. And we'll probably won't be any, anytime soon. Uh, so keep up the good work. My, my concern is I'm looking at, it's really the fund balance is not really the 16,000 plus that's shown at the end because there was a beginning fund balance. It's really, uh, we have a more serious uh, fund balance. And I'm a little bit concerned to approve a budget with such a large gap. I'm gonna ask the commissioners point blank, are there areas where we can shave the budget down a, a, a bit to come closer toward a balanced budget? I'm not saying there can't be any fund balance, but if you really take, you know, we're really in a, not a negative 16 plus, we're really in a negative 57. Yeah, well, just, just before they answer, Mike, and just so everybody remembers, if you look at the left-hand column, 
Last year, they were supposed to have $503,000 of, of revenue. They actually took in uh, almost 505,000. So they got a couple thousand dollars more in revenue than we had budgeted. Um, the library commissioners and the library director from the very beginning of COVID understood the need to try to save money. And the, um, the goal was because the library fund, just like the highway fund, gets all its tax money every year. That's how fund accounting works. Uh, we reduced the taxes, the tax rate by four cents. That all was, that reduction all happened in the, in the general fund, which isn't up on the screen. The library got all their tax money in 2020. They worked hard, they furloughed staff, uh, they cut back hours and everything else. And you can see here the regular pay uh, you know, they spent 90% of what their budget was, and that was mostly due to furloughs. So they ended the year with uh, a $470,000 expense, which was about $40,000 less than they were approved. And their goal was to generate a pretty big fund balance on a percentage basis. You know, it's almost, uh, what is it? Um, 41 or 28, 10%, uh, 8%, something like that of, of their budget. So this, this fund balance, we really tried to make a bigger fund balance. The plan was the library was gonna end the year with a, with a, a basically a zero balance budget. That's how we always budget to zero. So you're correct, Mike, that this year the revenues are you know, $57,000 lower than the expenses. But that's because for the third year in a row, the select board has directed me they want a 51 cent budget. And we, I mean, a 51 cent tax rate. And we all get that. The library's 484, 430 last year represented about 11 and a half percent of the total tax dollars. And in order to get to, to maintain a 51 cent tax rate, um, you know, I did a lot of things and said, all the funds are gonna have to take some hit either in reduction in uh, spending or in reduction in revenue. And this is, this is what I came up with. So this is really what the select board needs to concentrate on tonight. Is, is this number good enough? It, it, you know, can we live with this? Um, I told the library commissioners over the weekend, if I were them, I would ask you to, you know, can we increase the tax rate a little bit? They haven't done that yet. Uh, and I'm not sure that they will, but um, you know, if, if, we, if we said we could live with a 52 cent tax rate instead of a 51 cent tax rate, um, you know, that's a, that's a 1.96% increase that would generate about $76,000. And if the library fund got 11 and percent of that, you could increase that, that tax line by $8,700 or so. And, and that would drop the, the negative fund balance at the end of the year, almost in, almost in half. And then the commissioners could decide, are we going to, add some revenue from the trust or we're going to cut something. I think that at the end of the day, the budget that goes forward, my preference would be that this number here, the ending fund balance for December 21 would be zero. That would be our goal to get back to a balanced budget. And if we don't, we don't. But I, I really don't like the idea of just leaving the 16562 there uh, and see what happens. But that's clearly an option. Yeah, well, based on your narrative, Bill, that you sent out to everybody um, in your request for them, the, the, for the commissioners to uh, somehow take that 16,562 and turn it to zero, uh, I was kind of a, assuming that was all that was in their lap uh, and was assuming that, that they were gonna deal with that uh, either now or suffer the consequence of having to deal with it as part of next year's deficit, um, that's why I guess I'm I'm happy with 
you know, the 433, 535, uh, you know, that's, I guess, through this whole general conversation about the this budget, um, I guess that's kind of why I was wondering back when we'd set the tax rate there in the spring, you remember I had mentioned whether or not the select board was willing to meet halfway on the difference between the 51 and the 55 cent um, that we were um, Right, I, re I remember that, Chris. And, yeah, and, and, the board of... and the board decided to go to 51. Right. And then two months ago, when I asked you what you wanted for a tax rate, the board said again, the goal is to leave it at 51. So I, I understand, you know, we cut the budget last year and there was some thought on the select board, you in particular, that said, well, maybe we should just cut it back to 53 or something like that. But the board made the decision to cut it to 51. Right. And the board two months ago, when they when we started this budget process, told me let's keep it at 51. So you know, well, based based on your narrative, Bill, I mean your projections for 2022, <laughs> you know, I mean that's I guess that's what kind of got the hair up on the back of my neck is that we're gonna suffer down the road perhaps. Um light of making this 51 cent tax rate. Uh, I understand and I, I'm not I'm not advocating for the 51 necessarily. I'm I'm I've just done as I was told. And if you right. want no I, I didn't say you were doing it moderate that sum then we can well, that's what this discussion's for. Yep. So I mean, we're we're specifically in, in this part of the conversation talking about library. Um I guess my question is, is we're now halfway through January. What's the expectation of the continuation of the savings on the expense side of the library budget, at least through, I'd say, quarter one, maybe quarter two. And then is that 16, five found during those periods? Because it looks like the budget for 2021 is matching 2020, but really we're going into a, a continuation of this COVID era of yeah. uh, business and does that mean that we're going to find some savings that will match what we really spent in 2020 and then we should be fine? I don't, I don't necessarily think so, Mark. I understand the question, but this 211 445 in 2020 had the staffing level that Almi has now with her staff. In April of 2020, uh, two people were supposed to have hours increased by, you know, four or five hours a week uh, that would trigger, um, you know, retirement benefits. So that was supposed to happen last year. The first quarter of 2020 was uh, at a lower rate, and then the last three quarters, it was supposed to ramp up. We didn't do that. Those hours did not get increased. And then of course, people got furloughed. So we cut back here. This 210 uh, for this year, as you can see is $1,100 or $1,400 less than it was last year at this time. This maintains those two staff members at their current level of hours, which is the same level that they were in January of 2020. Uh, and this contemplates going up in April. There have been a couple of staff changes. So um, I don't think that the savings, the, the, the staffing and the operating schedule that the library has right now, um, unless they don't increase that staff hours, it's gonna pretty much be this 507, which is $2,000 less than we budgeted a year ago. So I think the answer to your question is no, the, the uh, current COVID situation, unless we furlough people again, is not gonna get us anywhere down close to this number. I was gonna say, unless you see a huge resurgence in this COVID and people really get sick to the point where the library is gonna get shut down completely um, for some time, I don't think you'll 
see too many changes. The only thing you could hope for is that maybe somebody donates you know, a little bit to the, to the library. To, uh, let me, let okay. me ask a question. Um, another big item besides payroll is books. Uh, we're still in a COVID kind of situation. Are people still taking out books or using more online resources or? Um, I can speak to that. This is Almy. Sure. Uh, that book uh, line item, even though it's called books, actually covers all the materials that we purchase for the taxpayers to borrow. So that includes all of our digital subscriptions, magazines, okay. streaming, digital books, all of that, and all of our print collections and non-traditional items too. So it's a little bit of a misnomer to call it just books, but that's kind of the simplest thing. Yeah. Um, I also would like to just clarify one thing that, uh, that Bill said is um, this budget for the staff line includes a reduced uh, somewhat reduced hours of staff through April 1st. Um, as Shannon mentioned at the very beginning of our discussion. Um, and, and one other thing is it's only one person, uh, one staff person that was scheduled to have their hours increased by four last year. That's the technology librarian whom we are desperately in need of this year, as you can imagine with all the virtual things that we're trying to do. Um, but the other person was already at uh, above the level that required um, retirement benefits, uh, and she was reduced during COVID to below that amount. So it's not really a, a new person getting that. It's, it's a current staff person going back to their regular hours. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. It is a misnomer because I was going to say in this era of books, you know, digital materials are probably if that covers a lot of that that's that's really important because i would say if this year if, if it was more hard books i would say this might be a year to cut down purchases but if that's digital media that's yeah and I, 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 collection purchase if you want yeah i did uh i did transfer uh a fair amount of our quote unquote print book budget into digital resources when the building was completely closed and we weren't even doing curbside. Uh, once we started curbside, I really saw the demand for print go back up. People wanted all those new books, their favorite authors, the bestsellers. So I had to, you know, reshift things a little bit at that point. Um, Michael, you had asked the question before too, are there any places in the budget that seem to be I guess, low hanging fruit or places that could be easily cut. Um, I think, you know, given the work we've done and Bill gave a very nice summation just now of, of where we're at, I think um, there's nothing that can be reduced in this without feeling it, um, feeling it somewhere. Um, so I guess our, we, we were, um, we would like to get a better idea of from the select board what your position is on moving the needle a bit past 51 cents um, to close this gap, um, or at least do something to contribute to closing the gap. Well, you probably have to hang around for the rest of the meeting, Dan, That's to get that point. answer. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> I'll get the answer tonight. I mean, but, but... Whatever the answer is, will be communicated, and then they can act on that. Yeah, you know. that's what this discussion is all about. <laughs> and we we have discussed that kind of before, and I think, you know, with every with all the community feeling the pinch of COVID, I think the sentiment of the select. I can't speak for every member of the select board, but I think we were. It was a strong consensus to hold the line on revenues that we collect from the community. I think with people hurting to, to ask for more to balance, I'd, I'd rather see, I hate to say everyone's going to need to tighten their budget. If someone's without a job, they're doing that already. So I think we as a town need to follow suit. 
Katie, you I'm want just, to say something? Yeah, <clears throat> Curtis Osler, just, just to simplify, I guess what Dan was saying is, where do, so what is your decision? Where is your decision on the our proposed number? What does the select board see and what are they suggesting we do? I'm happy with it for right now. You know, we still got a lot more to talk about tonight, but I'm, I'm satisfied with what I'm seeing. Um, I don't know how the rest of the board thinks. Bill, my odd question for you, is there a way that they could take a loan out from us and then they would pay us and then we would keep their interest in everything too? Um, well, probably not. Katie. Typically, you, you, know, you, you don't borrow money for operating expenses. If they, if they were going to uh, you know, have to do something uh, real expensive in terms of equipment purchase or something like that, um, the, uh, the, um, you could consider that. I've, I've contemplated that in, uh, in fund 76, the, the line, the, the, the budget that this 61,015 goes to. Uh, I told the board a couple of weeks ago, we've been having some heating problems. So rather than uh, put the full, I mean, the full $20,000 that we probably need this year to, uh, to pay for that uh, problem is in that fund 76 budget. But in that budget, I have proposed borrowing that money from ourselves just so we don't have to make this 61 in the library's budget. If we did it all in one year, it would have to be like $11,000 higher. So I've already done that somewhere else, but directly into this budget, that would not make sense. What is the balance of the trust fund? $565,000. Okay. I think my, my concern is the obviously the, the negative number at the end and then ongoing the concern of what happens in 2022 and we don't have a balance to carry forward. Um, I, I think, I think Mark, everybody has agreed that the, the 16, 562 deficit won't be there. So right. that if, if, if we, I think what Chris has said is he's happy with what this looks like in terms of the 433, in terms of the 507, 830, and he would be willing to leave it to the commissioners to figure out how to close that $16,500 gap. Is that correct, Chris? That is correct. Yeah. yeah, I guess I'm just hearing from Dan, wondering if we would be willing to um, try to increase what is in orange. Well, I think that'll shake out you know, with the rest of the discussion. That's kind of why I'm anxious to move on to some of the rest of it so we can get to that point. Didn't mean to interrupt you there, Mark. Yeah, I mean, it. it as long as I'm not hearing a, a, a lot of concern about that, I'm happy moving forward from this discussion with that number, but I am starting to feel like once we get into the discussion surrounding CIP and other fund balances that we might need to consider moving off the 51 cents. But um, I, at, at least I feel like uh, you've done a very good job trying to control costs this year and I would assume it would happen again in 2021 but I don't I, I just don't like putting anyone in a situation where they can't do do their programming because we're underfunding them either so I have a little concern there it does and I know that we haven't made that decision yet and I'm sure the library commissioners as uh, as um incredibly entertaining as this discussion is, they probably don't want to hang around for all the rest of it. They're certainly welcome to, but uh, does everyone kind of, just so the commissioners have a clue, if, if the select board decides to increase the tax rate from 51 cents to something, are you all also okay with doing that proportionally? In other words, the library fund gets 11 and a half percent of whatever, whatever increase is. Correct. Yep. That's an if. Yeah, yeah, I understand it's an if, Mike, but 
if I, I'm just trying to set the table so they understand, yeah. uh, because you you could say, sure, we're going to increase the tax rate two cents, and tell me to put it all in the in the CIP, and you know that doesn't get them anything. So I'm just trying yeah. to let them understand what we all agree the rules of the game are if there is some more tax revenue. Can we can we also look at in the trust fund because I'm sure if their investments are anywhere like most investments, this was a pretty good year when it came to the end to where investments would be as to possibly as part of the solution to bump up that trust fund contribution. Just yeah, a thought. I think I already touched on that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> that was my point. The, the commissioners have that role. Uh, the trust did uh, well this year. Um, you know, it did really well, uh, given that if you looked at it in um, in April, you know, it was down a lot. Um, but right now, just so everyone knows, the Library Trust Fund. What came, was the increase this year? That's what we it wanted. It came to know. into 2020 with a $496,000 fund balance. I mean, with a $500,000 fund balance. 50376 was the fund balance on December 31st, 2019. Uh, they gave uh, 14255 and the trust uh, increased by 79000 So the fund balance went up from 500376 to 565. So it increased $65,000 in 2020. Oh. And as recently as 2018, I think the contribution was 35,000. But as Dan said, the library commissioners along with the select board frankly, you know, kind of talked about that the select board decided with the tax stabilization fund to go to the voters and ask for the ability to take out up to 5% of the ending fund balance of any given year. Uh, the library commissioners have not set really that policy. They've moved away from the, the old formula that they had. Under the old formula, they'd probably be you know, giving $35,000 this year. And this might be the year that that old formula really worked well because we had a tough year in terms of our budget, but the investments did very well. So, um, you know, but. I'd just like to speak to that if I can. Uh, I understand the temptation to say, oh, there's this big pot of money there, just take some of that. The fund is there to be in perpetuity. And this isn't even a retirement fund where we know we're holding it until we retire and then we can start spending it. The idea is the fund needs to be sustainable. So yes, it is certainly an option to look at taking some more money from the fund if we need to, but if we keep getting into that every year, we lose more and more of the fund. It's not sustainable. We need to look at this as a sustainable fund. Curtis's point too, once, if we go too far down that road, we also start masking the actual costs of running the library. Um, right. So those two concerns, I think, make us be very uh, cautious with, with that number. Now, I don't think anybody's, you know, we're all aware of that possibility and uh i think under the circumstances nobody's asking to down that rabbit hole of taking larger larger amounts and staining taking those larger amounts i think this is a, a one-time consideration at least in my perspective um just to mitigate this year's issue um a lot of things can change here in our near future i don't want to get into speculating but uh So if I could, if I could clarify, then the, what the select board is asking us to do is account for that sixteen thousand five hundred sixty-two dollar deficit and zero balance. Is that is that what you're saying? Unless the tax rate goes up, and then maybe things look different. Correct. Yeah, I think I, I think you know to, to say that you're hooked solid to that number right now is uh, premature. Um, and we need to get through the rest of the budget discussion. Come to a a landing as to what we're going to decide on a, a 
actually number, uh, then those that decision particularly and along with some others would be firmed up at that point, you know, and then then we take the ball and run with it from there. So I think it's premature to get too worked up about that. This is just a draft of what is possible. Uh, and by the end of tonight, hopefully we can either mitigate some of that or we may end up finding that that along with Bill's other proposals are, are I guess our best option. We won't know until okay. later in the night and it's getting later as we go. Are you ready to move on then? Yeah, I think, yes. I think we can move on to the overall budget review if that's okay with everyone. Okay. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, library commissioners. Thank you. Do you have any other thank questions? You. Ask them thank now. you. The library does a great job. Thank you. Thank Good you night. for your support. Okay. So I'll put the highway budget up first, um, and you know you can you see here at the top of the page um, to get to the fifty-one cent tax rate, and you know cutting the, the library's taxes as significantly as we did, um, we still have to get there between the highway fund and the general operating fund. And as I said in the uh, in the narrative, you know, in one sense we're very fortunate that we have over a million dollars that's going into capital funds, and that, that's funding those capital funds. Uh, all of that money is not going to be spent in in the year in you know 2021. Uh, it's it's funding capital expenses down the road as well. Um, and for now, um, I took the approach that, you know, in order to have a tax rate in the 51, 52 cent range for three years in a row, uh, without gutting uh, real operational services, the only way to really get there, well, it's not the only way, but the way that I thought best to get there was reducing our contributions into the capital fund. And because so much of the capital fund um, transfer comes out of the highway fund, uh, you know, about 850,000 last year versus about, you know, 180 or 200,000 out of the general fund, that in the highway fund, it was really the place to go to get the money. So you can see there's a half a million dollar uh, reduction in taxes going into the highway fund that looks great except if you look at the general fund you know the taxes going into the general fund are significantly higher Bill? a couple of things and i pointed this out in the memo as well bill carla wanted something are you are you are you intending to screen share something didn't i no. no, I'm looking at my other screen to get the information there. I, there's nothing on this screen. All right, hang on. I don't know why it's not. I don't know why it's not there. Where's the page name? Hang on a second. I apologize. I was actually was hoping that you'd go to the general government first, but. Um, well, I can, but I gotta, my computer is freezing up. It's not letting me do anything. Oh, God. A little while ago, Bill, um, our internet went down, so I lost most of what I had typed, but that might, but it's back up now. Yeah, well. The minutes are going to be brief. I, yeah. So I'm out of everything. 
All right, let me try to get that back again. I had to close out of everything. Um, you want to do the general fund budget first, Chris? Yeah, I, I kind of would like to start there if we could, if nobody has any objections. All right, hang on. Oh, I can't wait until we can have regular meetings in person again. <laughs> you ain't kidding. Something must be wrong with our computer system, Carla, because I can't get into anything. Maybe it's got the COVID. Yeah, the settings are the same as they were an hour ago. Gremlins. Do you want one of us to try to share it and we can navigate it while you talk about it? Say, yeah, I think I you do do it. Do that because I can't get anything on my computer to open. I have no idea how to do any of that. <laughs> I try to share, but I'm going off my cell phone, and I have a feeling it's not going to work very well. So, Katie, can you open it? All right. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Okie dokie. Um, budgets? Yep. That one? Yeah. Which one of these, Bill? GG, general yeah. government. Good enough? Yep. Okay. Um, so anyway, you can see at the top, property taxes last year were 1832, and we actually collected or billed 1522 or whatever that is, it's hard to read. Uh, so about 309,000, 310,000 down, and that was the reduction in the tax rate from 55 cents to 51 cents. This budget for the general fund is proposing 2,129 in property taxes. So uh, 309 is not delinquent then, Bill. No, the 309 is just the difference between what we wanted to bill and what we billed. Between the 51 and the 55? Yeah. Yeah. So the 55 would have billed out 18, 1.8 million, and the 51 billed out 1.5 million for the general fund. So, anyway, the tax rate or the, the taxes here, even with 51 cents, and you can see over on the right, this is what I proposed for the, uh, for the three funds, 2 1. Up at the very top there on the right, Katie, 212, 2129 for the general fund, 1.33 for the highway, and 433 for the library. And that 3.894 is the total that we raised in 2020 and will raise again in 2021 if we get no increase in the grand list. So there might be a little fudge, the grand list might increase a little bit but it's estimating the tax rate for 21 at 51 cents. So, so Bill, can I, I need to just ask some questions. Okay. While you're yeah. going through this. Uh, so the 21, 29 that's proposed for 2021, that's at a 51 cent tax rate as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Chris, do you see the little chart there on the right? Yes. I see that bill. Is that based on a grand grand list? If, if, 2020. I, I just explained it, Chris. 22129 plus 1331 for highway plus 423525 for library. That comes up to 3894290. That's what we raised last year. That's what we, we will raise this year. 
for the 51 cent tax rate. Now the green list might go up a little bit. So if we if we budget 3894 and divide it by something a little higher than 7.635, the tax rate would be a little bit less. But right now I'm planning a 0% increase in the grand list and a 51 cent tax rate. And it comes up to 3,894 divided up those two ways by the two plus. Okay, do you understand that? Well, do you? Or, I mean, don't get mad, Chris. I'm, I'm, I'm not the one getting mad, okay? Um, I was just trying to figure out why the huge increase in the property taxes themselves from 2020, if the tax rates are the same, why, why the huge jump in tax revenue I didn't know if it was from the grand list increase or am I missing something? You're missing something. The, the, the deck has been reshuffled. Last year, we raised 3,894,290. You see that number on the right side there? I do. Okay. Last year, that's what we raised. Last year, that 3,894,290 was... 1.8 million for the general fund. It was um, 1.8 three, 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 million one. for the general fund last year. It was 1.8 million for the highway fund last okay, year. Now I'm getting that's 400 and 484 for the library last year. This year, it's just split up this way. 2.1 in the general fund, 1.3 in the highway fund, and 433 in the library fund. It adds up to the same thing. 1.3 now, that's because of the half million dollar reduction in the highway that you, we looked at just earlier. Right. That's why it's down to that number. Right. And I was okay. trying to explain before that it's because I used the general, the, uh, the shift to the, the, I lowered the transfer to the CITs, and most of that money comes out of the highway fund. So right. it's just the deck is shuffled. That's all. Yep, I understand. Okay. So between the three funds this year, um, let me see if I can get my narrative to come up so I can just read it anyway. If not, I can pull up dual screens up here too, Bill. I got it. I got that. So anyway, the the library fund and the highway fund um, ended with significant surpluses at the end of. 2020. The general fund ended with only a $25,000 deficit. So the three funds together um, are, our fund balance coming into the year was about $150,000. And as I said in my narrative, in a normal year, if we came forward with $150,000 to the good, it would be a pretty easy budget year. But what you have to remember is that last year's budget over over on the left hand column there for all three funds needed 55 cents to operate. Uh, we came in with a, an operating surplus of $150,000, even though we collected 305,000 or billed 305,000 less in taxes. Um, and these things that are in yellow are really the big question marks. So if you remember at the beginning of COVID, I wondered what is going to happen with our payments from the state. 
I think in my memo, what was it like seven hundred thousand dollars that we that we got from the state in in twenty twenty. Uh, we got three hundred thirty four thousand dollars of pilot money. We got one hundred two thousand dollars of current use money. Uh, ninety one, ninety two thousand of forest and parks money, one hundred thirteen thousand of highway fund money. I don't know what's going to happen with those uh, intergovernmental transfers from the state. I'm hoping the highway fund, the forest and parks, and the current use will be maintained at their twenty twenty level because they have a general fund um, funding source. Uh, the pilot money, though, we know that. Uh, revenues for rooms and meals taxes uh, in particular and sales and alcohol are down. So um, what I've got right now is I'm figuring last year we got 234 in pilot payments and we put 234 in the general fund and we put 100 in the paving fund. This year I've got 175 coming into this fund and I've got $20,000 going into the paving fund. So that's $195,000, which, uh, which is about 60% of what we got last year. And, you know, a week ago, I was figuring that we were going to get 40%. So this number is already a little bit on the roll the dice high side, I think. Um, and, and we won't know. There, we're, we're not going to know any answers to these kind of questions for several months yet. Uh, probably on the pilot, we won't know until October. Um, we won't know anything else on these state payments, at least until the state budget is uh, far ahead of where it is right now. So uh, these are just kind of placeholders, and I'm hoping that we can get this amount. Katie, if you want to go down, please. Stop at the bottom of the revenues, right there. So you can see last year, the difference were $276,000 in revenues, which means we actually did better in a lot of revenues than we anticipated that pilot in particular town clerk's fees, which were up a little higher. We did a lot better on that. But the total revenues were still down by $276,000. Um, and you can see here that the revenues are up a lot, but that's that kind of, um, because the deck is reshuffled on the taxes. So it's, it's really not a good apples to apples comparison. Um, Katie, go up a little bit here, up a little bit. So does the board have any questions uh, about the service fees that I've budgeted here? Um, most of them are rec program numbers. Uh, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago with Nick. Um, and the rec, the rec program is actually, because of the grants that we got this year, did, uh, they weren't as big of a loss, uh, a loss either as we anticipated but we still have a net expense for all REC programs. Um, any other questions? All right, go, go on down to the expenses, Katie. Go right to the bottom of the general government, right there. So the general government budget is, is up. Um, by about $12,000 uh, from budget to budget. You can see there in yellow, uh, last year we budgeted to transfer $15,000 to the cemetery fund. We ended up not sending them anything. I'm proposing sending them half this year. I think it's important that we continue to fund the cemetery fund, even though they have a reserve fund of their own. Um, you know, it's the town's responsibility to maintain those cemeteries. And if we go back to not funding it at all out of the general fund, then when we have to someday, uh, it's just a big increase. So it's a small amount of money, but I think we can get back to the 15 incrementally. Um, 
I talked about the county taxes. That's up a few, you know, five, eight lines from that last week. Uh, it's up $21,000, but that's only because we didn't send them the $21,000 we owed in November. They told us we could wait until April. So uh, that's really a wash. There's not much else. Go up a little bit, Katie. So any questions there at all? If, let's say, of course you don't know. I was gonna say it, pilot isn't gonna be determined till October. I mean, cemetery fund, I hate to say this, is that is that on the table? Well, of course it's on the table. You, you can do whatever you think you have to do. Last week, I had that at the full 15 to return them to what, you know, what they've historically been getting. Uh, it's been $15,000 since we started funding it. It's not ever gone up. So, you know, if we were increasing it by the rate of inflation, even it would probably be up in the $35,000 range now. We didn't give them the money last year just to kind of try to save cash. Uh, if you want to cut that out, we can. Um, I don't know that it would be at this time. But. Yeah, so Katie, go on down to the to the next budgets. Public safety. Um, I have been in communication with uh, Major Jonas of the State Police. Our contract expires in at the end of June. Uh, I. I've been working with her on the language for the new contract, and I tried to incorporate uh, what Chris asked, which was to provide a little bit more flexibility on the hours that maybe on occasion we could get some, you know, Saturday daytime coverage and the like. Um, I got a response from her, and she said, we're not going to be able to kind of give you an answer until we get a lot further along in the state's budget process. Uh, that's a little bit scary, but even if they said no right now, I think our answer would be we wouldn't have a police department at all. And that would be, you know, that's what would happen for 2021, I think. Um, I kind of think that given the state has a challenge with its budget, that, you know, they don't have more personnel uh, because of this contract with Waterbury. They're just dedicating two people to cover Waterbury. And I would find it pretty amazing if they decided to give up a $300,000 source of revenue uh, right. without making corresponding cuts. But this this 383 here, that's a 5% increase. It was a three-year contract. We paid 365, 100 all three years. They have not communicated back to me yet. So it's really a placeholder right now. And it's pretty likely we're gonna to have to just carry whatever number we think it's gonna be and then react to it later. Um, we'll just have to pay the bill. So any questions on the police thing? Okay, keep going, Katie. Talked about the fire department last week. Um, and I talked last week about the fact that uh, the, uh, the siding on the, um, on the station that we need to fix, we should fix that out of the, the fire stations fund, which is one of the capital funds. And uh, this proposal is to put $20,000 into that fire station CIP and Gary's estimate to uh, do the work on the building was $5,000. And I'd like to have that $15,000 in the fire station CIP going forward. Um, you know, if we were putting $3,000 a year in from when the station got built, we'd have about, you know, 24,000 or 27,000, I think by the end of this year. Uh, and we don't have anything in there right now. So, we could cut that back to um, one, 177 if you wanted to send the, um, 
seven thousand or five thousand to the to the CIT fund and spend the five thousand and still have nothing in reserve. Um, the reason I left this here, you know, initially I was going to trim this down and trim it down proportionally from what I do in the in the uh, highway funds, but the buyer contract that we have with Duxbury speaks to the the expense that we have for our operating budget. And if we didn't have this two capital fund line here in the operating budget, Duxbury wouldn't be paying for any of the, you know, ongoing equipment and, uh, you know, infrastructure um, expenses. So we show this here so that it's part of what Duxbury pays us. And I don't, I mean, I would be willing to move that back down to 177 for this year if you wanted to, but I wouldn't want to go below that because the whole point of the contract with Duxbury is to have them pay their fair share of our expenses for the fire service. And were they, I missed, obviously I wasn't here last week, so I apologize I asked this question, but uh, contract, with them, how did that compare to the year before? Did, it's, uh, did we give anything more away, I guess, is my question? Down, it down, Chris. Um, last year, the contract from Duxbury was 114075 and I think it's, uh, it's about 113 something this year. It's actually gone down. Yeah, it's because it's because our spending. It's a backward-looking um, contract. So if you can see here, because we cut spending in 2020, uh, we only spent 97% of the fire budget. So the contract is based on what we spent last year, and because we cut the budget a little bit, uh, it goes down a little bit. But it's it's an incremental reduction. So I'll go ahead down, Katie. We're all set there, I guess. All this stuff is pretty pro forma. Um, I did include money in here for the animal control officer last week. It was, I think, 10400 And that was the $500 a month plus an hourly wage rate of, I don't know, $16 or $17 an hour when they had to go out for calls. But we're already halfway through January. We don't have somebody. Uh, the 6,500 would do that from April to the end of the year, figuring that we're probably not going to get anybody before a town meeting. So um, I cut that a little bit. Um, last year, you can see we budgeted 500. I know Mike has been kind of strong that we shouldn't have to pay too much for this, but we don't have an animal control officer. And we've been advertising, you know. It's been advertised several times. I had somebody reach out to me about three weeks ago, right before Christmas, saying that they were interested. They told me they'd get back to me right after New Year's, and I haven't heard boo from them since. So um, it's not a job that too many people want, I guess. Continue down. We talked about the pool budget. Um, you know, I have mixed feelings about the pool. Uh, we've got the pool over there. If we don't run the pool, we actually, um, you know, the pool costs more to run than we can take in on it. Uh, but the rec committee and Nick feel that having the pool is really a big plus for the rec program. Um, it's about the same cost as we budgeted last year. So, um, that's that. Continue down, Katie. We talked about all this revenue stuff. I mean, all this recreation stuff with Nick a couple weeks ago. Um, and a lot of the line items in the programs up a little higher. Um, you know, there all these expense lines are dependent upon how many kids sign up. And if enough kids don't sign up for that mini camp line, we just don't run the camp. So <laughs> There's a pretty good revenue stream that backs up the rec programs. Continue on, Katie. Uh, 
parks, um, you know, they would like to go back to kind of more normal operations. You can see here that I've cut that down. Um, in a normal year, we have a part-time guy that helps in the parks and we budgeted 19.5. <laughs> we didn't hire that part-time person last year, but we didn't have any fall leagues going on. So we didn't have to uh, maintain the parks as much as we have in the past. We just did it with our standard crew. We didn't even use the highway department as, as often to cut. So that's why you can see that regular pay uh, we only spent 14,000 instead of the 22 that we budgeted regular pay. That's one of the highway guys. And that just kind of shifts his uh, expenses around from a department to department. I put the highway person back to what we have been doing the last several years, but I cut $6,500 out of the part-time pay line there. And then at the bottom in yellow, I cut the uh, transfer from the parks to the uh, capital fund from 5,600 to 1,200, um, just because that's the place that we can we can cut expenses. Go ahead, Katie. Planning budget. We talked about that with Steve a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's uh, slightly down. And scroll down just a hair more, Katie. So, you know, that's down um, $8,400. Some of that reduction is because we moved some of the grant line item work out of this budget uh, to the cemetery budget because that's where the tree stuff is going to happen. But the revenues also went over um, to the cemetery fund as well. So, this is down slightly. Um, we're still, we, we almost met our budget with planning fees this year. We budgeted 24, we took in about 23.5. Um, the staff is recommending for 2021, no increases in fees. Again, just for the sake of expressing, we know it's tough out there for people. Okay, that's it really, Katie, go down. <laughs> the debt management, I cut the interest rate down a little bit. I look back last year, we came into the new year with about a half a million dollars in the bank. This year, we've got $1.7 million in the bank because of the big amount of borrowing we did right at the end of September. I mean, right at the end of December. So we shouldn't have to borrow as much in anticipation of taxes. We overspent that interest line. You can see there we budgeted $5,800. We spent 12.8, uh, mainly because we didn't have a tax collection in August and we had to keep borrowing right through until we started collecting money uh, later in the year for taxes. And this year I budgeted a couple thousand dollars less than last, and it's about $9,000 less than we paid. Special articles is just special articles. When we pass the budget, Katie, uh, just for your information, this 56,900 in special articles will actually not, um, not show up in the budget because they're, they're not really budgeted until the people vote to do it. So that this special articles budget is just assuming they all pass. And if they all pass, it costs $56,900, which is about five sevenths of a penny on the tax rate. If some of them don't pass, it will be a little bit lower. But there you can see, we ended the year with a $25,000, um, scroll up a little bit, Katie, right there. We ended up, up a little, there. We ended the, the year with about a $25,000 deficit in the general fund. We did have a little bit higher beginning fund balance than I anticipated that always changes um, when I do the budget, I'm pretty conservative. Uh, we get to uh, we get to post expenses. I mean, uh, revenues that we received through the end of February back to last year. So we did pretty well on the collection of delinquent taxes last year between January and February. So when we ended the year, we had about an eighty-five thousand dollar fund balance. But by the time we got 
to where the auditors post the fund balance is really $40,000 more. So that helps us. This 25,099, frankly, I think probably will go down a little bit from here. It will be less good than it is right now, but um, I, I can't say that for sure. Um, it's, it's a little tougher this year to collect delinquent taxes than it has been in the past, just because I think more people really don't have the tax money to pay. Um, it's not that they're being lazy, they just don't have it. So. The fund balance may drop a little bit, but anyway, that that fund balance gets carried forward, and uh, we end up the year right now with eight hundred thousand an eight hundred dollar uh, proposed surplus for the end of the year. Go all the way back up to the top, Katie. All the way up to the top of the whole spreadsheet. There you go. So. Um, if we didn't have this taxes at 2.1, if we had the taxes only at 8.8 uh, .8, like we did last year, you know, it would be $300,000 in the hole given what this budget looks like. And part of the hole is not knowing what this um, revenue from the state is, the pilot money and the and the forest and parks and the current use. Um, I think we'll get 175, but will we get that other 20 that's going into the paving fund? If you had asked me last week, I had budgeted, I think that we were gonna get maybe 140 altogether. So this is a little bit more um, risky than we were a week ago. Bill, do you have any indication of uh, what this, either through VLCD or somebody there, what the state's contemplating for education taxes? I, you know, I keep hearing this 9% increase. Yeah, that's what you've heard, Chris, is the last one I've heard. Um, they, just, they just convened last week on Wednesday, so they're not really very far into it. Um, and you know they've, they've, got, they've had all kinds of revenue problems as well. You know, the whole state's budget obviously is funded by income taxes, sales taxes, rooms and meals taxes, fees and everything, and all of that's down. I did hear last week that uh, the, uh, the actual numbers are looking less bad than they, they were projecting a couple of months ago, but you know, I'm sure it's nowhere near what they had, what they had built their budget to take in. Well, I also I was talking to a gentleman today whose wife works for the state, and apparently they're having conversation about uh, about their pension issues. Um, that that's becoming a real problem for them too. So uh, yeah. they're saying that the state employees are going to have to cough up more, and oh, I'm I'm just I want to be prepared for yeah. Yeah, worst case been, scenario from the state. You know your pilot, your pilot projection there. You know I think is. I wanted it to be, Chris. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm guessing the same thing. You know. And uh, you know, to your point on the the state pension, the state treasurer came out and recommended to the legislature last week that they actually cut the pension. Uh, promises made to the state uh, employees and to the teachers. Yep. And I think if they do that, they'll try to cut the uh, promises to the new people that they're hiring, not change it to the old ones, but I don't know that for certain. Um, fortunately, the municipal pension system, um, it's all funded by the state's municipalities. The state doesn't put any money into the municipal pension system. And of the three uh, pension systems, the municipal, the state employees, and the teachers, the municipal pension fund is the strongest of all three. Um, it's not 100%, but it's it's up there. So uh, anyway. Bill and Chris, there was an article uh, today on Vermont Digger in regards to that. Um, Treasurer Pierce was indicating more of 
existing retirees weren't going to be affected. What you'd probably see is that there's going to be a change to what the benefits are to people who have not retired in the state. And again, it seemed like the bigger cut is going to happen to the existing teachers funds because that's the biggest nut to, to crack. So you talked about I, I would take a look at that if anyone hasn't seen that Vermont Digger article. It's pretty interesting. You talked about no COLAs going forward. Right. No, no cost of living increases. Um, so to your point, Chris, that's, and, and while the library people were here, um, I think Chris and Mark and I, to a degree, expressed, well, maybe we can incrementally push this up. But I think the other, the elephant in the room all, always is that education fund. And I think, you know, the select board, when you told me two months ago, <laughs> target a 51 cent tax rate, I really didn't push back because I'm concerned what's gonna happen on the education fund and it all comes out of our same pockets. Um, and we, we do, you know, I don't like underfunding the, um, the capital funds to the degree that I've proposed here. Uh, I think we can stand it for one year as I said uh, last week, when we looked at the capital budgets, let me see if I can get my computer to work again. I want to put something up if I can. Katie, you can take that one down if you want. Yeah, she already did. Here's that one. Uh, yeah, I can get back in. Hang on, let me get that capital fund up. All right, let me see if I can share the screen here. All right, so here's the CIT fund. So this is the paving fund. Last year, we had $100,000 from Pilot going in here. Uh, this year, I've got 20. Um, and um, I've cut the transfer from the highway fund into this budget from 447 to 655. Um, from 447, 655 to 256, 430. And we already talked about that grant. If we don't get that grant, we'll have, we won't be able to quite paid as much as we've got here. But anyway, the paving fund is not too much changes, but remember last week, and this is where I think we can make some adjustments. In this infrastructure fund, you can see here the debt principle of 12.5 that we budgeted in 2020 and the 25 of interest that we budgeted, that was to pay uh, the loan back to us. So we borrowed $125,000 and from the tax stabilization fund, we're paying it off at $12,500 a year. We lowered the interest rate last year after COVID. So we went from a 4% interest rate to like a one in one and three quarter percent or something like that. But you can see here in 2021, the debt payment is $41,700. If you go down here to the 
uh, vehicle fund, this is the same thing. 28.4, that's what we're paying to the tax stabilization fund. But in 2021, it's 80,400. That would be um, 80,400. We'd have the 28.4 still going to ourselves. That's $52,000 there of the $1.3 million that we borrowed for all the fire trucks and the roadside mower and everything else. <laughs> if later this year, the select board allows us to um, refund that note, um, the, the note was $1,366,880. Right now, we're planning on amortizing that thing over five years. So it's about $250,000 a year. If we amortize it over, say, 15 years um, instead of over five years, we drop that payment down to $91,000. So this CIP budget right now even with this reduction of, our, of the transfers, you can see here into the highway vehicle fund, we, we were scheduled to put 149,395 in last year, we did so. That was the same budget that I was planning on carrying forward this year, but I've cut it to 85,575 here. And this budget with the, with the things that we've decided to buy and spend on um, right now, uh, these consolidated balances. We ended 2020 with $605,000 almost in the CIP fund. Um, we were, when we reviewed the CIP last week, this ending balance was about 365 for the year. Now, because I've cut so many of those transfers and reduced the pilot money, if we keep everything here exactly as it is, we end the year with 181,377. But this 181,377 uh, includes making a $253,000 um, debt payment to pay off that $1.366 million loan. And if we drop that from say 255 or whatever the number is, to 91, like I just talked about, you know, that's, that would go up by $164,000 right there alone. I think you've got to refund that note. Uh, Chris, you weren't here last week, but of the 1,366,000, we wouldn't, I don't think we should refund it all. There's some of that stuff that we bought, like, you know, highway trucks that have a five or six year or eight year life expectancy and you wouldn't want to refund, you wouldn't want to pay those over 15 years. But the fire trucks, you know, you could refund, you could pay those off over 20 years because they have a 20 year life. And I thought when I was talking last week about this, that, um, that I would uh, kind of do it in such a fashion that we could um, that we could we could pay that, the note out pay that off say in fifteen years instead of five. Can you? Yeah, but that one point three million that included the two fire trucks, the tractor. Yeah, the two fire trucks, the tractor. A um, couple of pickup see, trucks. You can see here, so. The way here's the 1.366 million that we borrowed, right? And you can see here, 11,000 went into the rec fund, and that paid for the roof on the on the pool building. Um, and that, you know, that's a legitimate capital expense that you could refund that over 15 years. Um, 950,000 of that 1.3 went to to buy those fire trucks. You could legitimately refund those over 15 years. Um, 260,000 went here into highway vehicles, and the the roadside mower was 
one sixteen of that, and then this tandem truck, which we haven't finished paying for yet because we don't have it yet, was the other. So I was thinking that we would, and then up here in the infrastructure fund, uh, this one forty five is basically uh, paying for the Main Street project, which is a legitimate, you know, expense over time. So you know, I, I haven't. I haven't recommended the amount to refund, Chris, but maybe what we would do is take the 1.366 million and and uh, let's say pay off um, 300,000 of it over five years and pay off a million of it over 15 years. Um, but we we can decide that later. We don't have to decide how much we're going to refund now but all i'm saying is that if we refund that note all of these debt service lines that are contributing to this hundred eighty one thousand dollar deficit down here right uh they all can be reduced and we won't be in such a hole yeah well at this point i mean i i agree i don't mind amortizing what vehicles we can out to, you know, not necessarily to their entire life expectancy, but the short a time period that we need to and still be able to delete that 181. My bigger concern is not to use all our powder, dry powder now, uh, use what we need to, 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 to eliminate that deficit um, and save whatever we can you know, if we happen to have a need to do the similar, well, I don't know if we can next year because we'll have, we need a, a larger, we need more more uh, substantial items to be able to go to the bank and say, hey, can we amortize this out further? But I mean, we there are things that we can borrow by note. We're in pretty good shape ourselves. You know, we still have the capability of borrowing from ourselves. Uh, you know, the tax stabilization fund, um, you know, performed performed well um, this this year, uh, despite the big you know loss that we had in, uh, in early in 2020, yeah. um, but. You know, that fund is still, uh, even with the reduction of $50,000 that we took out this year, um, the fund was a million one thousand at the end of uh, 19, and it's uh, 997000 now. So, you know, it's, it's down four or $5,000 from last year. And we're paying that back. You know, we're, 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 we're paying all these loans back to ourselves it's at a lesser interest rate than it was, but it's still a reasonable rate of return. So, um, you know, we're in an okay position. I do think, you know, I hated to reduce the transfers into the CIP by as much as I did, but to get to the 51 tax rate, 51 cent tax rate, we needed to do that. I think this fund can stand this reduction for one year, um, and and next year we would have to go back. And next year, of course, you know, uh, if we go back, I don't think anybody expects the tax rate to stay 51 cents forever. You know, we'll we'll have a little bit of an incremental uh, increase, but it's a, it's a challenge to keep the same tax rate for three years in a row. I think we were 52 cents in 18 or in uh, 19, and then we dropped to 51 this year. And now trying to stay there again. I mean, talking to a few friends today, there we all agreed that we'd rather see incremental increases in our tax rate than huge jumps. You know, any given year, uh, even if it means, even if it comes with a little bit of pain. But uh, well, the inflation rate right now is. Um, running at about 2.1%, the last I looked the other day. Uh, if you multiply a 51 cent tax rate by 1.021, it goes to a 52 cent tax rate. 
So the two percent increase is one penny on the on the tax on the tax rate. Um, if we were at fifty five cents, and this is what I said in my narrative, if we were in fifty five cents, like we had planned to be in twenty twenty, and it increased two percent, that would be up to about fifty six point two five or something like that. So um, we're still behind the curve a little bit. But I hate to push it too much this year. Um, 51, maybe 52 cents, a two cent increase on 51 cents would be a 3.9% increase. Chris, I, I agree. I, I don't like the idea that um, we get through this year at 51 and then most likely jump back to 55 or hopefully not beyond. But I just, if we already got approval from the voters prior to COVID to go to 55 cents, we took aggressive measures and dropped it down to 51. I really don't like seeing these fund balances as low as, as they are and potentially in the negative without this restructuring some debt. I personally would rather see us go to like 53 cents and take all of that additional funds into the CIP to just protect ourselves from whatever might come down the road and, and not hit everyone hard in one single year. But you know, we're still, we would still be under what we were approved last April to bill out, but we're at least protecting ourselves financially then I don't know. I, that's that's my feeling on it. I don't necessarily know if I want to offer any of those additional increases to the library necessarily um, through our discussion, but I do think that we should consider a higher number than 51 cents this year. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I hate, I hate deep, you know, I'm the last guy and I've said it a hundred million times before and I hate seeing increases in taxes. Uh, but I think we're going to be feeling the pain of this damn COVID for another couple, three years. And hopefully things will get better with the people that are really having a tough time. Um, you know, whether they're slowly getting back on their feet or they manage to jump back, back into things, uh, it's not gonna be any less painful to them if we have to jump, huge tax jump, you know, next year, or yep. I guess I'm willing to take the gamble. I, I agree with Mark as well. Uh, you know, a 53 cent tax rate is still, obviously it's two cents lower than we set for a year ago, and it's it's about three point three and a quarter cents lower than it would be if we had a two percent increase on that fifty five. So, you know, you are even with a, a couple penny increase, you are in effect holding the line still. I think. I mean, we have a better chance of of holding a line, whatever it might be, if it's fifty three cents next year. If we go to fifty three cents now. If we use, like I said, if we use all our dry powder now, you know, and we get into trouble next year, where the hell do we turn? Uh, I'd rather take roll of dice and, I mean, what's the worst, what, worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to vote us down at Australian ballot and uh, we'll be back to the drawing board. Um, just circling back to the library a little bit, and I know nobody, you know, bound you to swear an oath that you were going to share with the library the, the increase. Just so you know, if you if you um, increase the tax rate to 53 cents, a two cent a two cent increase on the grand list is going to get you somewhere in the 150, let's say 152,500 just to kind of split the difference. You get you 152,500 if you kept all of that and put it all into the CIPs like you're suggesting, that would be, that would be my preference as well. 11.5% um, of the 155 
or the 152, um, 152.5, 11 and a half percent of that would be 17,530 for the library, which is even $1,000 more than they need. Um, I might suggest rather than live by that formula, formula of 11 and a half percent, that if you decide to go to 53, just tell the library, I, I would give them something if I were. I was going to say, I'd give them 5,000 bucks. $5,000 and say, you know, uh, we, we can't afford to give you the whole 11%, but we'll give you $5,000 of it. I think they would be good with that. Do the other members of the board have, I mean, I, I, mean, I know, Mike, you had mentioned earlier, I don't know if you've changed your position on this, but I'd be interested to hear from you, Katie and Nat, um, what your yeah. feelings are. I somewhat idea. at first I was really wanted to hold the budget at 51 cents. I might be, I still, I know you're talking about 53. I might say like go to 52 to have somewhat a little bit of an incremental. I don't want to give, I think we have to keep a lot of the department's budgets somewhat in line because we're in a very precarious situation and by increasing numbers you know via taxes that kind of gives some of the department signals oh we could you know we could restore ourselves and i'm i am concerned about that especially i like the idea what was just said about the library throw them a bone give them five thousand dollars and you have to find find the rest so we could have a you know somewhat balanced budget uh, I don't know. I, you know, I was at first, I was going to say I'm sticking hard to 51. I could see a little bit of an increase. So if we do have future increases, it wouldn't be so much so bad, but 52 cents looks a little kinder to in, in my lexicon. So you got a $180,000 deficit in the CIP right now. Well, that's where I'm looking at most of that coming from is where you where, where we could restore a little bit into the CIP budget. I yeah, think that, that I think the problem is it's going to still stick Bill back in the uh, the mindset that he's going to have to handle right. something else in order to make up the difference. Just remember though, the 181 deficit in the CIP, if we refund that note, it's going to it's going to be more in the $25,000 range as far as the deficit is concerned. Not, it won't be 181 without doing anything. I still think whatever you raise should go to the CIPs. Uh, I agree. Because that's where, you know, not, it's not just the lion's share. Almost all of the cuts were made to the, to the CIP. I mean, I made some incremental, um, Changes. Let me put one other budget up here because I want to make sure that Chris in particular. Because knows that's, about it. that's the easiest place to get big ticket numbers where some of the other budgets harder to get, you know, those big reductions needing to keep taxes in line. Bill, yeah. did, Bill did you ever have a rule that you try to set as CIP balance as a percentage of overall budget and you would try to get to that every year? Because I do fear that obviously CIP, question, Mark. CIP seems to be the easiest place to pull funds from, but the whole idea behind this is to continually try to fund it every year for large expenses. And I know we've had some large ones in the last couple of years, but as we all know, there's other large ones coming. So well, you know, we, um, I, I understand that, Mark, and the answer is no. Um, we've talked about it a lot, uh, but you know we've had we've had kind of several things over the years that have thwarted us from doing that. You know, we we had the financial crisis in the late two thousands. Um, now you're muted, Bill. We had uh, the financial crisis in the late 2000s. Uh, then we had the flood. So we've, we've always kind of done this three steps forward, one and a half steps back kind of thing with the CIP. And we've never, we've never had a 
policy that we're going to have, you know, 5% of our budget or, or any percent. It's, we've just never done that. Let me put one more thing up just so Chris can see this. I want to ask you another question, Bill. That uh, 2%, um, our 2% of the Main Street construction project, that ends this year? Yeah, and that number too, I've, I've taken the CIP number down, but I put that in the narrative. That number will also come down. I think I had $160,000 in there again for 2021. Um, it's going to go down. There's only about $2 million of the whole project left. Uh, there's some things that are not participating that we have to pay the full freight on. But, you know, 2% uh, of $2 million is 40. So I think that that 160 that I'm carrying in the CIP right now for the Main Street project can drop down probably to 50 or $60,000. Uh, but I want to check that with Woody and Barb Farr first. So that, I'm glad you remembered that, Chris. That's another place where we'll pick up some money. Well, I guess my point is we don't have it in our lap next year, right? Right. It will not be there anymore. So, so that, that'll be a big boost to us. Yep. yep. Um, so here's the highway fund budget. And you can see I've done, I don't think this general aid to highway is going to go down like the pilot payment is. But I have budgeted about a 15% decrease here just because I know state revenues are down. Um, that's probably a conservative number. My bet is it will be higher than that because I think for January payment and April payment, we're going to get what we got last year because that was from their, you know, FY21 budget and they're working on the FY22 budget that will start in July this year. So that 96.6 is probably a little bit low, but I wanted to be conservative here. Uh, the taxes are way down. If we increase the taxes by two cents, this is where it will go up. So we can fund that CIP basically out of the highway fund. That's where that will go. But if you go down here, I did make some changes here. This column is the proposed column. And uh, for 2021, Celia asked for $56,000 of salt again, and she asked for 55.8 of sand. Chris and Mark and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I have not shared this with Bill Woodruff or Celia yet, but um, this is kind of the takeaway I had from that conversation, which was if we want them to use less, we have to provide less. And I don't know if you're still all in line with that or not, but I did make significant cuts, you know, 20% cut in salt and 11% cut in sand. Mm -hmm. um, the diesel line up here, um, <clears throat> this is what we budgeted for last year, full year. This is what we spent. I've gone up to about 45, and that's because of how we're operating right now. Um, fuel prices, though, if you've noticed, are, are going up pretty quickly. They've been going up about a nickel a week or so for the last three or four weeks. So, uh, you know, I, I think this isn't a huge gamble, but I did cut that as well. Um, and here's the big cut, 362,000 cut from the capital funds. So if we increase the tax rate by one cent, this will go up about 76,000. If we increase it by two cents, it'll go up by about 152,000 uh, minus whatever we give to the library. But any tax increase right now, unless you tell me otherwise, you've all kind of indicated this is where you want it to go. So I, yeah, if, up till now, I just want to clarify something. I know I know our percentage, 2% portion of the Main Street project this year, you're saying might be around 40, 60,000. Yep. It's been what, 100 and? 
Uh, let me see if I can find it again. 140,000, 160,000. It was a hundred. It was budgeted as 160 uh, this year. Let me see if I've still got it up. Uh, no, I'll have to call it up again. Hang on. I'm pretty sure you're right. It's 160. That's. Yeah, what the, that's I know that's, it was 160, but let me let me call it up here again. That's two cents on the tax rate. Um, yeah. So if we went to, you know, we went to 53 this year, next year we don't have that 160,000 expenditure. That's two cents that we're saving right there. So that might, might hold us at 53 next year, you know? Uh, yeah, it could. Well, it, it'll go a long way to helping us there. Right. Right. So here's the. Uh, oh, I gotta. I gotta share my screen. There we go. So here's the main street. So this 160 is what we budgeted. Right now it shows that we spent 181.943. But as I put in my narrative. Um, Woody and I are still figuring out the, the village share or the EFUD share for this year. So I think this is gonna go down probably close to the 160. It'll be about where we budgeted. I think they're gonna owe us about $20,000 this year. And then this for right now, I carry this 160 um, and I put this note in here. So I think, this will go down, which will increase the fund balance in the CIP that we're carrying forward this year. And this will go down, which will uh, increase the fund balance for next year. And then next year, that 160 won't have to be there at all. So I'm thinking that this number here this year will be in about the $60,000 range, just to be sure. I, I wouldn't want to go too much below that. Um, and then that's it, you know, we're done. And I guess, uh, and I'll say this last thing and then I'll, I wanna hear from Katie and Nat. Um, so if we go with 53 this year, um, I believe that the pilot, your pilot number is high. Relating, um, I think the state's in worse financial trouble than, anybody knows at this point. Oh, I think they're going to, you know, if they reduce that on us, we're going to wish we had that other penny. Um, and if we can hold 53 cents, you know, hard to tell right now what's going to come up between now and next year. But if we can hold 53 cents for this year, 53 cents for next year, I'm great to death with that. Yeah. And because in the CIP, Chris, um, I for 2021, I've kind of loaded all of the CIP, I mean, all of the pilot money, if it comes into the general fund, there's only $20,000 in the from pilot in the CIP this year. I think whatever comes from the CIP, we would put 20 in here and whatever failure of getting that money we can let that be in the in the general fund because there are places if we have to um, we can we can cut we may be able to it'll be easier to cut operating expenses in the general fund than it will be to cut this stuff because if we don't do the stuff that we have on this list in the CIPs this year and we didn't do some things last year, we, it's just going to put us not so much on the money, but just in terms of being able to catch up, you know, and have the to do the projects, uh, we're going to put ourselves behind the eight ball. Yeah, so I want to fund this as best as possible. Yeah. And the other thing about the 53 cents is it kind of levels the playing field and the CIPs. Um, so that's where I'm at. Matt. 
Um, yeah, I guess I'll go. Um, like I remember a couple meetings ago, I said we should think about maybe looking at a 52 cents, but if that's going to put you still in a pinch bill, then I could see and understand why going to 53 would make the best sense right now if we don't want that big jump to surprise people in a few years. And I think that if we go about it with a mindset that we can hold 53 cents for at least two years and share that with the community, that that would be more positive. And then the other thing to comment on with the library thing, I'm fully in agreement that we shouldn't give them the full percent that they asked for, the full amount if we just, you know, the six, five or 5,000, whatever we um, all agree on, I think is good, not the full amount though. I'm struggling with it. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, uh, a while back, I was I was one of the proponents of, of holding a lower tax line, but as Bill, you said, the the deck has been reshuffled, and um, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how to make do with what we've got. Um, I'm somewhere between the 51 and the 53, but um, I guess it doesn't make much difference if we ask for 52 this year and ask for 53 next year. So we might as well ask for 53 this year. <laughs> and, well, you, you know, make make it a little bit easier on uh, on the municipal services that we're providing. You can you can set tax rates with decimal points. You know, we've had We've had 43 and a half cent tax rates in the past. You know, you can set it at 51 and three quarters. You can set it at 52 and a quarter. You can set it, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole number. We have had fractional tax rates in the past. Bill, can you remind, I feel like I ask this every year, can you remind the cost on the taxpayer per penny on $300,000 in home value? 75 something, isn't it? Six. Um, yeah, I just did this for all of you this afternoon. So, uh, 300, so one penny on the tax rate, $76,000, one penny times 300,000 times, uh, a penny is $30, is it $30? 300,000 times 0 0.01 times 0 0.01, $30. I feel like that's an important part of this conversation is really understanding what these numbers mean to the taxpayer. I really, I, I think I'm gonna stand pretty hard that I think that it would be a mistake to push down too low and not I think Bill did a really good job of sticking to the 51 cent to try to make the, the budgets work, but ultimately it resulted in us basically pulling a lot from CIP. And I think that we need to protect ourselves and also not protect ourselves from having a huge jump in tax rate by moving back towards where we were in the spring, still well below that but protecting CIP with some money into those accounts. Yeah, considering we asked for 55 and we got it, like you said, Mark, and now we, we reneged on that ourselves. And now, you know, it'll essentially be two years later, we're asking for only 53. I think, I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's an attaboy, you know? The last year in the in the town report, we've got a chart it's on page 19. So a 55 cent tax rate on a $300,000 house is going to be $1,650 in taxes. And if you make it 53 cents, it's uh, 1590. And at 51 cents, it would be um, 1530. 
So it's it's a sixty dollar increase from what they had this year um, at fifty one cents. Problem with this, in all reality, wherever we hold the line on our town taxes, it's going to make a difference in the education tax because that's going to. If they're talking like what we're hearing, what's going to happen to the education tax, that's what's going to kill people's property taxes, not not so much our town tax. Right. Never, well, it's always been that way. Oh, 100%. But that's where, you know, at least we're somewhat accountable to the taxpayer. But, you know, I definitely don't want to go to 55. You know, I was sort of leaning to keep it where it is to say, hey, we're trying to help people during this difficult time. I'm looking at, we probably have to do something. You know, when Bill gave the numbers on the CIP, that's where it kind of, I said, yeah, we need an increase. And I'm kind of, you know, I was kind of sort of brokering maybe a 52 52 cent rate was good, but from what Bill was saying, it didn't do a heck of a lot to that, what we could get back in CIP. 53 so, helps a little better. Well, just just so everybody knows, though, the, the Homestead school tax rate in 2020 was $1.74, $1. let's say $1.74. If that goes up 9%, that goes up to $1.90. $1. And $1.90 plus 53 cents would be a $2.43 tax rate for homesteads as opposed to $2.25 last year. So $2.25 last year on a $300,000 house was $6,750. And if it goes to $2.43 on a $300,000 house, it goes to uh, $7,290. That's the holy shit. Big jump for a lot of people. Yeah. So, well, I think if, if you keep yours at fifty-one and then theirs goes up, I know it won't. It, it doesn't start, make a lot. Yeah, we're we're yeah. only harming ourselves, you know. And with seventy-two thirty, right? I'll be honest with you. <laughs> people don't mind paying taxes as long as they're seeing something out of it. And I think the gains that we've made in our paved roads in the last couple of years, people are starting to be thankful that that work's getting done. And I hate to pull a plug and start to go backwards on our CIP. Yep. Just, you know, for the sake of a couple of pennies. Um, yep. Now, of course, you know, that 7290, uh, I think about 75 or 80% of our homestead folks qualify for a state payment. So. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> okay. Um, Nat, where are you at there, buddy? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with going with the 53. Uh, seems like it's prudent. And I hate to see it. Hate to see it. And I know the rest of you do too. Oh, yeah. Makes you wonder when it's ever going to stop, you know? Never. Well, <laughs> just a little, just a little tidbit from the program I watched the other day. The, the uh, co founder of Home Depot said that uh, in the not too near future here, uh, if if the hell they say if the interest rate goes up 200 basis points, our national budget will go up over 570 billion dollars a year in interest payments. Additional 570 billion. Yeah. Uh, and he said at that point everything's going to be on the table. So it's you know we're just a drop in a bucket. Yeah, I know, but. We're our own bucket. We got to go through this. You know? Yeah, it's the a little bucket. The only other solution is either move to Tennessee 
or become good friends with Elon Musk. <laughs> well, when the national debt explodes, uh, no, yeah, there's no going to be no place to hide. Um, Bill, do we need? Can you remind me? Do we need to actually vote on this tonight, or we just set you in motion? Well, uh, I think that is everybody nodding. Uh, do we have a unanimous consensus of 53 cents? Is, are we there yet? I I would say that with the consideration, keep the keep the, the library budget in line. I don't want to oh, give them. You, you 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 folks are in control of that. As I exactly I told you, all weekend long, the only thing the select board can tell you is how much tax money that goes you're going to get. Now we did kind of say we'd share whatever 11%, but I think that the expectation at that point was that uh, maybe you'd be increasing by a penny. Uh, so I think you do need to tell me how much you want the library tax to rate, you know, how much on your tax. I think it was 433. Um, well, they tried to force us into an answer and you know, I think they had it understood that we had to get through the rest of this meeting in order to come to solution, come to a solution. And I think whatever they end up with, if we throw them a bone, uh, it'll be better than what they started out with. I think there was an earlier uh, I, suggestion I, I of 5,000. I do think you need to ask, you need to tell me tonight how much the tax appropriation you're going to give to the library because they've got to, They've got to finalize their budget. They can't wait next for next week for you to do yours. So I think I think there was a suggestion of five thousand. I'd be in support of that if the rest of the board is. I I would back the five thousand. Okay. Not a penny more. <laughs> I I I think I'm I'm becoming right of Chris. All right, Scrooge. <laughs> Okay, I'll tell the library 5,000 more, and I will then uh, redo this budget. Uh, but really, the only line item that's going to change on this budget is that highway department transfer to CIPs is going to go up by right. about $50,000. That's the only change I'm making. Um, can I, you want me to leave the $7,500 there for the transfer to the cemetery or you want to cut that one more year? Cut it another year. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go out and mow the lawn myself. <laughs> Why don't you shuffle, Mike? What do you promise? Um, I could run a lawnmower pretty good. How, how's their investment portfolio doing? Is It must be doing as well as everybody else's. Exactly. They've got a, they've got a, they had a good year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I no, the, your suggestion though was not to cut that to get used to that payment. I, I would, I would leave it at seventy five, which is still half of what normal right. is. That's already in the budget that you presented to us, right? So yeah. I would be in support of keeping it. Personally. Okay. I'll come. Seventy five is reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Good. Fifteen's not. And Chris, for the second meeting in a row that you attended, I have to, I'm, I'm sorry, I got a little frustrated at the beginning. I've been working totally. about 20 hours every day. Uh, I was going to say, so Bill, this time of the year, you're a grizzly bear because of the hours you put in. And I, I, I appreciate it and understand it. So no, don't ever worry. There's no hard feelings. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I think if there's nothing else in order, I think we can call this meeting to a close. Motion to adjourn. Okay, good. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Carl. Good night, all. Thanks, Thanks for the hard work, Bill. Good seeing you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could see somebody. You somebody get me better internet up on Ring Road. I'm dying on the vine up here. <laughs> night, all. Hey, everybody. Later. You're going to have to pay more taxes. <laughs> <laughs>